Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books and Mathematics, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Corey Brunson, a host of the channel. I'm talking today with James Lademan and Carolina Weisner, authors of What is a Complex System, published by Yale University Press uh, last year in 2020. This monograph surveys the professional discourse and literature on complex systems, tracing from its professional origins to the present day. The authors assemble definitions, examples, properties, and crucially measures of complexity that reflect the diversity and disputes that characterize the field. In their telling, from these sometimes incongruous parts emerges a cohesive whole, and in this way their argument shares at least some of the spirit of their subject matter. James and Carolina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. To begin with, could you introduce yourselves professionally and describe the research backgrounds you brought to this project? Okay, should I I start? Uh, So my background is physics. I studied physics. I did a PhD in physics and started to study complex systems uh, as a postdoc. I study them uh, very much from the perspective of information theory, apply information theory tools to complex systems, and... um, uh, develop tools to study uh, uh, to study complex systems with, and I well I met James in a center for complexity science, a doctor training center, and uh, that kicked us off, and we started discussing what is complexity to begin with. So um, I, I'll I'll leave the floor to James to introduce himself, and then we can talk more about that. I'm a philosopher of science, and I didn't know a lot about anything to do with complexity or complex systems before I met Carolina. As as she said, when the university opened a doctoral training program and they were open to the idea of having some kind of reflection on what complexity was or or the foundations of the subject. And um, I thought that would be interesting to get involved with. So I, I kind of found out about it in order to teach students about it, what, what it was and um, work with Carolina on that and ever since. So you've led up to your point of meeting. So then how did you come to write this book? Well, I, we started writing a, an article about it and that was very much driven by a PhD student that, that James was supervising, which you know many projects kick off because you have a PhD student to work with. And um, that article was published. It got a lot of attention, which told us that actually we were addressing a question that many people were interested in, and there wasn't really a good answer about it. And after that, we, I think we just kept discussing because there were so many open questions, and we just kept talking about it. And then an opportunity came for a book. We were asked by a publisher, why don't we you know, write a book about it? And um, that was that was, you know, for us the motivation to actually go and do it. It took us years to do it, um, because we came across every new questions, new answers that, write, that led to new questions. Um, so it's a a book that is the result of many years of of discussing and and thinking about it. The good thing about that process is though that we could, you know, ideas would sort of settle down. Um, and when they would be they, they would be steady for a long time, we would think that we'd actually found a good answer, and that has proven true. So uh, we haven't changed our mind about it for for a while now. Uh, James, anything you want to add? Uh, no, let's let's talk about the content of the book. All right. So, as I mentioned, the book begins with a somewhat contentious attempt or somewhat contentious attempts to define complexity. So let me ask to begin with, what is generally agreed upon when it comes to complex systems? That's a nice question. And we we answer this question by actually coming up with a list of what we call truisms. And that's a term from philosophy that I've learned, um, which are statements that we thought every complexity scientist agrees on. Um, or even those familiar with complexity science. And that also has 
proven true over time. Nobody has challenged us so far on these on these statements. So the very first one is um, "more is different," which is a, a quote from from Philip Anderson, um, and it summarizes there's something emergent in in complex systems. Nobody disagrees with that. Um, another example is complex systems are probabilistic. Um, or rather, the study of complex systems is, is probabilistic and computational. Nobody disagrees with that. There is no overall controller of a complex system. That's the third example of, of something that everybody agrees on. So, and, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The thing that everyone would agree on is that complexity science is multidisciplinary. And so you, the, the point of stating these, sort of, you could call them platitudes about complex systems, we just... It is to just try to get clear about, given that there's a lot of disagreement, what is there not disagreement about? And even if some of these things sound obvious, it's sometimes it's useful as an exercise just to tell yourself, okay, well, what are the the things that we're sure about here? And um, actually in doing so, I think we, we came to a better understanding just by making these things explicit for ourselves. And um, yet they don't, settle the big questions that people have about complexity science so they we we don't include among these things for example what complexity is if anything and whether there's a property of complexity or or whatever because there is no agreement about that at least we're not until everyone's read our book you're right and i found it a good starting point for thinking about the subject because one you have some ground to begin on as a reader uh, but two you learn the terms of the debate so this debate arose it seems pretty soon after the discipline itself or in tandem with the discipline itself. So could you tell me a bit about how this discipline arose? Uh, yeah, well, Carolina, this is really your, your field. So you, you talk about that. Really. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to. The, um, the way we see it is that the, the field arose in the 80s, 1980s, and you could you could place, arguably, you could place the origins in two meetings that took place in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that were organized by people from the Los Alamos lab, which was just around the corner. And uh, people came from there, not exclusively, but, but mostly. And they had the idea of actually originally, um, well, first of all, they brought together physicists, economists, mathematicians, biologists and that alone was was pretty pretty new <laughs> bring these people together in a single workshop and um, they realized that there were ideas in one field that could very much that were sort of missing in in the other fields but very much needed so they you know through some uh, failure and trial and error eventually uh, came up with this with this institute or research Center for Complexity, um, and that was founded in 1984, if I remember correctly. So you can place the origin of the field there, but of course the precursors of it that are, for example, I mean, Berta Lanfi's uh, System Science uh, from from Vienna, from the 50s, and then then uh, Wiener, Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics. So there were precursors that were sort of led up to the idea that there is something which is, you know. Spanning the disciplines is not a, it's not a discipline, um, a monodiscipline. And then when should you call that a discipline of its own? That's when you come into all these discussions of what is it really? Is it unique or not? And does it just mean we're confused? or right? um, So uh, that's uh, why the... Sorry, James, go ahead. I was going to say, and the interesting thing is that um, complexity science relies upon these other disciplines that also kind of sit between disciplines like information theory mm. and um, um, computer science, um, which, which yeah. themselves are kind of evolving at, 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 um, in, the, in the 20th century. And there's all, also a lot of overlap with the field of nonlinear dynamics and um, the phenomena as people call chaos. And um, that can lead to a bit of confusion because many complex systems are also ones that in various ways are chaotic um, and vice versa. Um, but but there it's are... an interesting, it's historically, it's interesting, right? Because all these are... fields are sort of coming up at the same time. There's nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory, 
And the reason it takes off, because there's suddenly this computational power where you can, you know, you can now visualize these strange attractors that nobody really knew what it was. But then at the same time, you have computer science, which is taking off, and then you have complexity science, which is taking off. And, and some of the people are present in you know, more than one of these fields. So it's, it's interlinked, but still we've, we found it, it's important to distinguish between, in particular, like James is saying, um, chaos theory and complexity. We, they are two very different things. Yeah, Carolina, you mentioned the availability of, for example, software that can, um, as you later described, simulate or visualize uh, these systems. My impression from reading this chapter is that the field basically took off as soon as the technology was available to deal with it. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say. Uh, it, I mean, it's it's accurate, you know, from 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 the timeline, it certainly fits. And from the kind of studies that people do, numerical investigations are so central to it. And they wouldn't be possible without the computational power. James, would you would you agree? Right. And I think the other thing that's, I think, sort of related is um, Conway's game of life. And really? even though it wasn't um, automated when he was first doing it, it's that idea that comes up a lot in... Um, computational context of, of iteration and um, what happens when you do that very many times uh, and you get new, th- new things happening that you wouldn't have thought would happen if you only watched a few iterations. And I think that's such a key to, to um, such a key idea in complexity science. And um, there's, a, there's a connection there, um, I think. If I could ask one Brief question. You mentioned that the, the creation of these of the Complexity Institute of similar institutes in different places. Um, w- listeners may well be aware of them, but I'm not aware of too many university departments, for example, that are departments of complexity science. Is that the case? Um, have they taken off as centralized departments, or are they still very interdisciplinary with respect to the silos that are created, or the departments that are created under these in these institutions? You're right in your observation. I, I'm not aware of a, a university department that's called complexity science. There are plenty of research you know, institutes as part of universities or as their own independent um, research organizations. Interestingly enough, it hasn't, it hasn't sort of separated in that way like other new disciplines would. I don't know, neuroscience or whatever. Um, um, computational neuroscience would be an example. Yeah, it's an interesting question. You'd have to have hmm. undergraduate degree programs in complexity science. One could imagine that there would be such things. So moving into chapter two, you discuss a variety of examples of complex system. And as you recount, there's contention over which of these qualify as complex and which of them don't. So I thought maybe you could provide two or three examples to help us understand both the scope of this research area and the terms of the debate. Right, so let's start with the pendulum, which you mentioned. So that's a good example of a a system that can be very complicated um, without being a complex system in the way that people understand the idea of complex systems and complexity. So a pendulum system can be chaotic even, um, and there are well-known examples of chaotic pendulum um, that people may have seen but what you haven't got the other hallmarks apart from just it being chaotic you don't have the other hallmarks of complex systems so um, there are lots of parts interacting giving rise to spontaneous order some kind of emergent structure so chaotic now, is not a hallmark right that's what you're saying james right? sorry Cha- being chaotic is not a hallmark of complexity. That's right. It's not sufficient, and um, it's you know chaotic behavior is is sort of everywhere, and so is complexity in a way though as well. And so this is just an important point to make that when we talk about the pendulum not being a complex system, that's because we're thinking of the pendulum as a pendulum. If we were thinking about the matter that the pendulum is made up of, right. Um, then we would be thinking about it as this incredibly complex system with all sorts of emergent order and structure and and lots and lots of dynamics and interactions happening inside it. And I think that's a 
the kind of crucial point about talking about complex systems is a bit um, silly in a way to, you know, you can ask the wrong kind of question when you ask, is this complex or not? But to a degree, it, it has to do with how the system is being, what aspects of the system you're interested in and how it's being modelled and represented. Yeah, yeah, that, it's that's a very important point. Yeah, at, at, what, at what level are you interested in, or are you looking at the system? Right. When you talk about complex pendulum, uh, sorry, <laughs> a chaotic pendulum, um, then you look at the pendulum as this single object, which is a solid, you know, non-flexible. It's just there, and it well, it has this dynamic to it, uh, going from left to right. So that's not complex, but focusing, focusing on the microscopic level, it might be. Um, you and- mentioned the example of tur- turbulent flow, and I, I was thinking, well. This um, makes me think about the importance of scale, that um, when you look at things at different scales, whether or not you think of them as simple or complex um, changes. So even something that seems very simple, if you look at it at a very small scale, over very short time scales, might be very stochastic and complicated in its behavior. So what about some systems that are unambiguously complex? Uh, some of the ones you mentioned that, I, as I recall, there's very little disagreement over are uh, social systems, whether that be human social systems or occasionally animal, um, you well, social what animals. Are the social systems, right? So, so um, air traffic control is not a complex system. It's a, it's a top-down kind of, at least as I understand it. I think they were trying to bring complex systems thinking into air traffic control, precisely because of the problem of dealing with the large scale uh, um, and not being able, to, having the the kind of un, the, the problems that arise from having top-down control, but. Um, Yeah, so an orchestra, that was the example I wanted to use. Um, Of course, you know, the fine details of how the orchestra plays um, do depend on feedback between other players. But looked at at a fairly kind of coarse-grained level, the orchestra is a social system that's directed by a central controller. Well, two, one the the composer and the other the conductor. So the score plus the the conductor is is controlling the behaviour, coordinated behaviour of all those parts. Um, Whereas... um, when you get spontaneous order emerging in um, crowds or, or traffic flow or something like that, then that would be a uh, complex social, social structure. Yeah, so that's, yeah, an orchestra is a good example for a non-complex system. And I mean, lots of animal systems are complex. The beehive is a beautiful example. And, uh, or ant colonies is another classic when it comes to complex systems where you have so much structure that emerges from the interaction of individual organisms that by themselves you know don't have much capacity in making decisions or in optimizing anything but through the many interactions between them you get you get both you know optimizing paths to food you get social structure you get task distribution and, and all that so you have this whole colony which right. which functions as one almost as one organism um, and and the question, the question of scale is again, is it, it's so it it shows up everywhere because again, depending on which level you look at, a single ant in that sense is c- considered, you know, simple, because it can only make very very basic decisions. But then you zoom in again into say the de- genetic programming that's happening within the ant, and whoa! And suddenly you have a new universe of of complexity. So it totally depends. Right, so any individual cell can be regarded as a complex system mm. yeah. of a, of a um, multicellular being, like a mammal, or, um, or, I, or I guess a, an ant. Since we've mentioned them just now, um, let me jump to a question I definitely wanted to ask, which is about some similarities you draw between complex systems. Some of them just conceptual, but some of them in terms of the actual models used to represent these systems or study them. So one example is that you uh, is a comp- is the similarity between the way social insects or um, you social insect colonies behave to the way that primate in particular brains behave. The kinds of feed uh, feedback loops that that produce consistent or adaptive behavior. And so I wonder if you could talk about some of these similarities and how they help help us understand the world of complex systems together instead of as disparate examples. So um, 
the example that one of the examples you just mentioned is is the brain uh, and uh, as compared to a bee colony or a beehive and it illustrates nicely not just what a complex system is but also what a complex city scientist does and so the similarity is is decision making and it's a conceptual similarity but it's also from the mathematical modeling point of view like you say um, you know there's simple experiments that have been done on well I say simple um, at least simple to understand that um, you have to you get a you have some visual task and you have to answer you know the binary question to answer is it yes or no and so apparently there's a conflict in the brain that some neurons would vote for a vote in, in in quote unquote for the answer yes and others would vote for the answer no and then the more evidence comes in the more one of these two answers you know wins over the other and at some point the organism the the human being or the animal that is conducting the experiment says the answer is yes. So there is a build-up to a decision process and then a decision is made and then the entire organism goes with that because right? the right hand is lifted for yes or whatever. And the same type of decision process is happening in, in bee colonies where, let's say, a new nest has to be found and decided to move the entire colony to and then different bees would advocate for different nests in this process of building up towards a decision. And at some point, there are enough bees that vote for one nest over the other that the entire hive makes the decision to you know, move to that nest. And so even the bees that were against it to begin with go with that decision. So it's a single decision that's being made by the organism. And in that sense, these are very similar both in the sense of you know describing it and also in the in the mathematical modeling, and it illustrates something which complexity scientists do all the time, which is abstracting away from what's irrelevant for that particular question. So whether we're talking about a cell, which is you know this this molecular object which has electric currents flowing through it and whatnot, or whether we're talking about a bee, which you know looks for honey or, or produces honey and, and looks for flowers and whatnot, is at that point irrelevant. What is relevant is whether it decides, you know, to go with one this one option or the other. Right. So this is this is really important that the, the bee in, happens to be voting by dancing and um, the, the bees that agree with the particular proposal will all be dancing uh, in, in the same way. Um, but it, as Carolina says, it's irrelevant that that's the the form that that, it, that their decision takes. If you're this, if you're studying how the decision as a whole emerges from the behaviour of the parts, and so a, a simpler example um, doesn't involve decision, just um, but a, an emergent phenomenon: the flocking of birds or in, uh, insects forming a swarm or fish forming a shoal, where each individual has a relatively simple set of instructions to follow you know every now and again have a look see how far you are from your neighbor if you're uh, too far away go towards them if you're too close go away um and um i said have a look but in fact they could be using echolocation like bats to see where their neighbors are or they could be using sound or smell or it doesn't matter the important thing is they're getting information and then making a decision on the basis of how far away they are and that will lead to the collective behaviour that looks coordinated, where the flock of birds all move together. And um, I think another example that would be very good for your listeners to think about is um, the coordinated behaviour that emerges through human beings interacting with um, different technology, social media. So interacting with each other, but where it's mediated by systems in some cases by AI systems that may be filtering, amplifying, selecting in various ways. And this is giving rise to new emergent phenomena and um, large scale effects that, that are not occurring because of some individual directing things, but because of the aggregate behavior of many people interacting in a structured way with, with various influences on those interactions. So, um, 
if we're yeah talking about ant colonies and the brain, we should also probably be thinking about um, the big complex system that is you know all the tech users and their media of different kinds. Yeah, I very much want to follow up on that topic. Um, you mentioned it later in the book, and I and I want to come back to it. And we can certainly bring up additional examples as we go. Um, I'd like to jump to the third chapter, which uh, where you, with the background of these examples, lay out a collection of features that are at least common uh, to complex systems. So I think it would be best maybe to just enumerate those features, and then we can talk through the partition that you introduced for them. Right. So I'll do the first few, Carly, and you do the next ones. Okay. So there's numer numerosity, which refers to parts, but also number of interactions, which is very important. Disorder and diversity. So that's the idea that the individual interactions or parts are usually not all exactly the same. And there's some, stock, some randomness in the interactions, maybe. Uh, feedback. So the parts are behaving in ways that affect each other and then their effects affect each other and their effects affect the effects. And, and it's obviously a very important thing to think about when you're thinking about social media and um, amplification of, of messages and so on. Mm -hmm. And then um, non-equilibrium, which refers to the idea that the systems are um, very often in the, you know, living systems or they're otherwise thermodynamically driven systems. There's some kind of flow of um, heat or information or energy. Um, well, not just energy, right? Heat, heat, uh, some, some kind of, some kind of structured um, flow of, of matter or heat into the system. I came to think of these as systems that were driven. Driven. That's really what I was wanting to say, but I was trying to cool. explain what's what that means, which is um, sort of non-trivial, really, because all of these terms, heat and information, <laughs> order, and they were contested and complicated. But um, you know, the rough idea would be something like the generation of uh, minerals in the Earth's crust is driven by dramatic gradients of temperature between um, events that are um, happening at very high temperature because of magma or whatever, and then co cooler temperatures of rock. That would be a good example. Which recalls the question of scale in that you're talking about geologic time scales here as opposed to everyday time scales that right. the complexity is taking sh is taking shape over that longer That's period. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if I if I pick up from there the features that um, we then list um, and we'll explain the difference, I guess, in a moment. Uh, the first one is spontaneous order and self organization. I suppose self organization is many people might have heard about it. it, it refers to the fact that the system is organizing without a controller centrally, you know, telling elements or people or animals or atoms what to do, but they're putting through this, through this noise and disorder that James was mentioning and feedback, they're organizing themselves into some kind of structure. And um, then nonlinearity is a feature which actually can be interpreted in more than one way. But one, one way to think about nonlinearity is simply that there are correlations in between, so that's, that's some kind of um, mutual correspondence between the elements or there's correlation over time. Um, but another way of thinking about nonlinearity is, is um, it, you were talking about drivers. So if there is a driving force from the outside, the system responds in a nonlinear way. So an example that we're all familiar with is financial shocks, right? Um, where maybe the stock market was just, you know, going on doing its th usual thing, and then some small thing happened, not actually massively different, but somehow it triggered a whole a whole sequence of responses, which is that that kind of nonlinearity that complex systems can exhibit. Um, Robustness is the next feature, which of course relates to order because order needs to be robust in order to be even you know, visible as as de um, detectable as as order. And um, nested structure, modularity are two related concepts, and 
it's just you can find a system within a system within a system that's one one way of thinking about nested structure um you know you, you have a beehive you can find within it different different uh, groups of workers within it you find different bees within it you find different cellular organization and so on there's always history and there's always memory so history is very generally speaking you know, every complex system has a history of how it became a complex system and memory is the system itself might have some memory about its own past which it then uses to it i mean for living systems that's the case for sure which Can we think of that as a form yeah. of fee- uh, closely related to feedback it's absolutely related to feedback but i think the important point we're making is that we won't some people would use memory to say well okay if um you know, you leave a footprint on a beach, that's a memory of you on the beach, right? But that, that, that's fine if you want to use memory that way. But the, the way we're using it is quite specific. It's more like the idea of the memory, the human memory or the memory in a computer. The point is, it's, it's something it's um, something you can access and use it information processing, right? So um, when an organism has a memory about the environment, it means it doesn't just have a real-time correlation with the environment. It's got some kind of internal degree of freedom to correlate with some state of the environment, which you can access, as it were, to have a look and see um, when it's running a model of what will happen if it does X, Y, or Z, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, a simple example is, you you know, thinking about whether you've got anything in the fridge, um, you know, in order to decide whether or not to go to the shop on the way home. Um, so it's functional. It's, 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 a, it, it's not just a trace of the environment. It's, it's a... It's a, a degree of freedom which has no particular connection w- with the environment other than the fact that you're using that degree of freedom to represent. The system is using that degree of freedom to represent. And to make a decision then about its own future dynamic. Right, right. and bit, that's the only reason s- organisms do represent, right, is yeah. in yeah. the first place. I mean, that's why we do it, presumably. Um, well, that's why our ancestors started doing it. It, you know, it's what um, sometimes called in um, yeah, decoupled representation is one way of putting it. To, to, I got that term from Kim Sterelny, the philosopher of biology. Now, the, the thought is if I just have um, some photosensitivity in a cell, then that gives me, as I was saying like before, and I've got correlation with the environment. I'm getting information about the environment. I can say, for example, mice, the main purpose of their eyes is so they can avoid light, right? So they, as soon as they get some light in their eyes they run away uh, uh, from that direction um but um to remember there's light over there and to avoid that area or there's food over there or whatever means that i've got to carry that that degree of freedom has got to stay in that state even when i'm no longer hooked up to the environment so it becomes decoupled from the environment there's now my little personal inf- storage of information about that state of the world yeah, and um, and it, yeah. it, it goes directly on to the, the last feature that we have, which is adaptive behavior, which you know, is obviously you need, you need some memory in order to be able to adaptively behave. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And to, you mentioned this term functional. Conditions. Yes. Functional a moment ago, which is related to adaptive behavior. And yeah. you know, all these things are, are tightly in, intertwined. And when I first read the book, it was, I, I, I guess I, I didn't carefully read the, the introduction to this section because I was thinking, okay, like, build, yes, this I can see in some examples, this I can see in some examples. It then came out that, I, that these are really a different, two different classifications of features, that this first, these first four features that James outlined are uh, what you call, um, I guess you call them features of complex systems. They help um, determine whether a system is complex or behaves in a complex way, whereas um, Carolina, the, the six you just itemized, you call products of complexity. And that partition, as I understand it, is really the meaning of this, of this notion of emergence that I'm sure everybody has heard of in this context, but you've operationalized it in a way that, that was very, very helpful. I, su- I suppose the thought is that the, the, the second six are the ones why we're interested in the complex systems, right? And the first four, are the things that they, features that they have that give rise to the things that make them interesting to us. If we just had the first four, it wouldn't be so interesting, right? It's when the first four give rise to spontaneous order and 
you know, nested structure. That that's what we're interested in. Then. What do you think, Carolina? Yeah, 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 absolutely. The, this is this is what it is. That's why. Yeah, that's why this this notion of some some people say, oh, complexity. I know it when I see it, and obviously that's you know that's not good enough for a science to say, oh, <laughs> you know it when you see it. Um, but these these things are the ones that strike us most as interesting. It's the spontaneous order. It's the you know, self organization. You might look around for a moment to be sure that there really is no central controller, but then that is what makes it so interesting. Um, and the first, it, the first four are, are uh, well, it's so important to list them because it gives you an understanding of how, how come, how is it possible. Um, and it's surprisingly easy to be possible. You just need a lot of elements, but you do need feedback and you do need this stochasticity in there. Um, so... And the system, like you say, needs to be driven somehow from the outside. Um, so to understand the mechanisms, you need to understand the first four. Now, the yeah. thing, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, James, please. I really want to stress is that um, complexity is really complicated in the sense that all of these features come in lots of different forms in different kinds of system. And, you know, that's hard and complicated, but it just is how things are and so it's not you know spontaneous order is not all always the same kind of spontaneous order right sometimes you're talking about just something like a crystal growing um or or a regular pattern appearing in a geological system like a hexagonal rock appearing uh, when the system cools and sometimes you're talking about um you know something really complicated in the brain or, or you know, a, a, a highly adaptive, highly sophisticated organism, um, you know, the ants who are solving an optimization problem about how to go around an obstacle or something. And um, there, there's so many layers of complexity between, in, between those things. Um, and that's why I just wanted to mention the history memory thing. I mean, What's okay? So I said memory is functional. But what's history? What's why are we saying history is so important? Well, just important to realize that even the most basic things that we think about are actually composed of this um, heavy elements. They're composed of heavy elements which required a long history of the universe to come into existence. Um, so you know, very easy to take for granted ordinary matter, but even ordinary matter is actually has a there's a lot behind that literally in terms of history so let's move on to chapter four where you introduce a variety of ways that complex systems or these features of complex systems have been measured or have been purported to be measured there may be some disagreement here too to begin with you get quite a bit of mileage out of some classical statistics um and so i hope you could talk through some of these more basic measures of disorder and diversity and how they've been applied. Yeah, the, I'd say the novelty of this chapter is that, you know, rather than saying, oh, this is, this is the measure of complexity and this is what you all should use, we're saying there's no such thing as a, a single measure of complexity. And, I mean, once you, once you realize there are all these different features, you would say, of course, there, there can't possibly be a single measure of complexity. But... You look in the literature and you find still, still up to these days, people invent new measures of complexity. And that's what we're saying is not that these measures are, are pointless, but instead they should be called something else. They shouldn't be called measures of complexity. They should be called measures of features or of a feature of complexity. And I mean, to me, this clarifies so much of the literature in in asking that question what is was this, this particular measure what is it really measuring and then you come to for example the statistical um, statistical tools like variance you what is variance so you you have some some measurement set of measurement data um, let's say flight direction in a flock of birds um, and obviously none of the birds you know 
fly straight 100% in the same direction all the time. But there is some variance in that direction. Um, and you might want to measure it. In particular, say, some, some predator comes along, then that variance would suddenly increase massively, and then it would go down again. So there might be some interest in, in doing that. And the variance is a measure of disorder, because it measures you know, how different uh, a particular property is, is, is exhibited by, by different elements. Um, another property which also measures variance or, or, or that kind of disorder, which is one of these uh, conditions of complexity that James was going through in, uh, a bit earlier, the Shannon entropy is a function, a mathematical function from information theory. And, you you know, you need a probability distribution over, let's say, velocities over, it could be types of types of elements in a, in in a, um, in a solid, it could be um, uh, types of people in a, in a social group, whatever, you can measure the the disorder, uh, or let's say heterogeneity is another word for it, in, in that group, in that, in that solid. So, Nice thing about these measures is you can use them on all of these different complex systems. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about atoms or birds or neurons. Um, and it's it's one reason why information theory is, is used quite prominently. And we haven't really talked about that so much, this information processing aspect. But but that's one way into, into uh, thinking about systems as information processing, simply because you can use information theory which is really applied probability to to all of these systems yeah i think you discussed this a bit in chapter five in your discussions of accounts or uh, understandings of complex systems do you want to do you want to comment go ahead and comment on that the use of information theory not only to measure a property or feature of a complex system but as a as a way to understand as a way to model or at least conceive of a complex system? Yes. James, do you want to say something about that? Well, I mean, I just think it's it's ubiquitous in understanding living systems and systems that are derivative of them um, to, 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 to represent them in information theoretic terms. It just So, for example, um, to think about genetics in information theoretic terms or um, to think about um, the digital economy in terms of people exchanging information. Um, so I guess that I think of information theory as an extension of probability and combinatorics. You know, it's dealing with the, the instantiation of communication in the world, like not the abstract idea, but the, the physical reality of, of A sending a signal to B and um, the issues that arise no matter what, who A and B are, or what kind of thing they are, or, or um, what the signal is about, which are going to be issues of fidelity. You know, how accurate will the message be, and what kind of um, what kind of forms of redundancy might there be in different information exchanging systems in order to bring about robustness, for example? Um, so, information theory is is just part of science now, I think, and it's just. It's just everywhere. The probably, I mean, when the when the word information is used, then you know somebody who doesn't really know what information theory is, which which is the majority of of um, people, I'd say, they think information is you know there is a there is a syntax, there is a context. I get a message from a friend saying, "Shall we meet for dinner tonight?" And that's you know a piece of information that this person is available and wants to meet me, and so on. Information theory is is much much more boring than that, really, because <laughs> it it is about the um, well, it abstracts away all of that context of I want to meet you, I don't want to meet you, and it only talks about um, events that out of all the possible events, which ones are how likely, and. Events could be anything. Events could be you know, a meeting versus not meeting. It could be a bee dancing a certain dance versus it dancing another dance. It could be 
you know, atoms colliding versus not colliding, all the physics and biology is abstracted away in information theory, and we're only talking about events and probabilities of events. And suddenly we can we can talk about communication between things by communicating that probability. So what's the probability of an event over here happening given that an event over there has just happened? What that event is is completely you know, outside of the theory. And so that's, that's the level in which information theory is so powerful because you can then use all this mathematical tool set, which it has been invented since the 1940s and is inside of all of our you know, tablets, computers, iPhones and whatnot. And you can use it to describe uh, complex systems in biology, in sociology, wherever. Um, and it's it's appealing because everybody knows something about information. We know information is relevant. And then you, once you abstract that away, you get access to all sorts of complex systems. I would mean, go further and say that because there, there, there's, as I was saying before, I think there's, it's true that the biological systems are processing information, but it, it becomes true to say that. Um, you have decoupled representations of the world and they manipulate them in order to uh, make decisions. And um, those decisions have different um, degrees of utility. So they can, you know, the decisions have goals. Sorry, the, the choices have different degrees of utility and the, deci- the decision making has goals. I mean, that's the distinctive thing of of biological systems that we can think of them that way. Um, so when you're asking by, you know, by the way, have any quantitative measures of adaptive behavior being, being introduced? I was thinking, well, fitness, it's, you know, that's the ultimate sort of, uh, cr- coarse grained uh, measure of adaptive behavior, right? In, in all over biology, when you mathematically represent the fitness of a, of a phenotype. Um, and, um, you know, one can have derivative notions. So one might think, well, if we're splitting, the, we're not thinking about the whole system now, we're just thinking about some aspect of its behavior, but we'll, um, we'll suppose that the, the, the fidelity of, of the visual processing um, of, a, of a, a, a tiger as opposed to just bushes is a surrogate, can be taken as a measure of their fitness. And so now we're just within studying that animal's visual system we could use uh some particular measure of the of the accuracy of their processing as as a a fitness measure right because as far as that task goes that's the relevant thing but you know it's going to be very um context dependent and it's going to be very um contentious and value laden whenever you start talking about fitness for human beings and I suppose the thought would also be that, you know, for some systems, so say engineering systems, um, your measure of adaptive behavior would be based on the goal that you've set the system to have. So if you're um, measuring the adaptiveness yeah. of, your, um, of your internet, um, then, you know, the goal is maintaining connectivity subject to perturbation or something. And Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I wasn't getting here at first was that to measure adaptive behavior, to measure fitness, you need to incorporate knowledge about the system, for example, what its goals are. What th- This comes back to this notion of functionality. Functional, This functionality property, functional behavior, is t- tailored towards some, maybe not consciously desired, but, but some outcome that helps it reproduce itself, right, or maintains it. Well, and, yeah, it's, uh, it's presumably so. so. So definitely not always consciously desired. But I think... The interesting thing is, you know, any system that you look at and um, you see that it's it's making choices that are giving it non-random progress towards some goal, um, then that can be put into a framework of this is a rational system. Um, so the beehive, that Carolina was mentioning before, the bees collectively want to move nest. It's in nobody's interest for them all to go in different directions. They have to make some kind of collective decision, and once that decision is made, they all go there. They don't. They don't split into different factions. Now, here's where, by the way, another interdisciplinary theory, catastrophe theory, is kind of relevant, right? Because there's the point where they stop arguing and suddenly all go, and that's this sort of, you know, 
um, crux point. There's a, there's a total difference about what happens before and after that point. But when they're in the regime where the decision making, um, then we we can look at them and model their behaviour and say, look, you, you could think their behaviour is just random, but look that they keep getting non-random choices of nests. And so it makes sense for us to interpret that system as goal-driven um, and as as performing a, a collective computation about where to go. Uh, so what's interesting is that um, our collective behaviour can also be interpreted as it might be that we form collectives that have goals and those goals aren't what our goals are. So if you're part of the, you know, some electronic culture, some digital culture, there may be emergent behaviors that are suggesting that that system is non-randomly progressing towards a certain goal. And um, you as an individual don't have that goal, but your behaviors on everybody else's are driving the system towards that goal. Um, so, for example, it might you might look at recent, um, in you know, say and say the system's goal is to drive everyone towards hatred and division, or the system's goal is to increase outrage, um, you know, uh, the system's goal is to um, eat every form of human culture and replace it with something digitally mediated. Yeah, you bring this up at, towards the end of the book, and it was. A profound point to me when I read it, and I did want to let. I, I wonder if we wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit more about it now. You propose these electronic, electronically mediated social networks as complex systems that have their own that exhibit their own emergent behavior, but that are constrained by choices that we make collectively about how to regulate them, how to construct them, less so how to behave within them individually. So what are the implications of this for society and for policy? James, you go for it. Well, here I want to mention my colleague Nello Cristianini, um, because it's him that I learned most about this area through. And and we wrote a paper quite a few years ago about persuasive technologies. Um, feedback is all important. Um, second order effects, canalization of choice architecture, right? Um, once you, once the digitization takes over, then the choice architecture is different. I mean, you can't any longer hail a cab, right? Um, or, or whatever it is. Um, you can't opt out of this system. This is now um, the ant colonies functioning. And, um, you know, if you're an ant, it's not good to be outside the colony. Uh, in fact, your life, um, in a sort of certain strict biological sense, has no meaning if you're an ant outside the colony, right? Because you can't fulfil any any goals um, as an individual. Now, uh, a human being isn't an ant, uh, but you know, we have a lot in common with with social insects, we, we are highly social organisms and almost all of our goals make no sense whatsoever outside of the context of other human beings. Uh, so what we're, you know, what we're doing is creating this new social infrastructure and um, that means that we have the potentially, obviously, to completely profoundly change everything about our social organisation and therefore about our individual selves, ultimately. I guess, I guess the difference... <laughs> Um, another difference to uh, the ant colony is that we have, you know, we have um, cognitive capacity to think about it and to come up with actions, collective actions also. And that's where, you know, policy might come in. So we can think about collectively that, you know, for example, um, to, to go against polarization in our society, which happens when you know, we get these echo chambers, which often happens in, within the social media. And although not every single user might not have the goal of you know, creating their own echo chamber because they're not interested anymore in anything else, but somehow it, it arises out of the, the many little decisions they make every day. And then we can go take a step back and think about this the dynamic in this complex system and what is actually um, 
you know, not desirable about it. And we can make decisions such as, you know, deliberative democracy, and we can decide to deliberately bring together very differently thinking people into a room and discuss something, you know, some political issue and and maybe not decide about it because that's still a you know, task of elected officials, but to make, to make um, um, well, to deliberate about it and then come up with advice and suggestions of how to do it better and how to not, well, A, how to make sure that not a single ant is you know, left outside of the colony and that the collective is moving in a direction which is, which is well, I would say positive for, for the collective. Um, so, so one one interesting thing um, is that, of course, lots of the agents that are part of this new complex system are not human beings; they're intelligent software agents, and they're either generating content entirely novelly, but more often they're modulating it, or they're just um, either forwarding it or not forwarding it, right? Um, liking it or not liking it. Um, but it's very significant that there are all those other interactions because as far as the complex system goes, um, you know, what an interaction is an interaction and um, when the system counts likes, it doesn't discriminate between the likes of human users and non-human users, for example. So, um, fascinating times, you know, um, potentially radically changing human social organization and um, since so many of our emotions cognitive states are adapted to our social organization and um, the way that we've come to form selves or or whatever um, is adapted presumably to some extent uh, to the ways that we've habitually formed social organization which have been sort of more or less unchanged um, for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, you know, that it's a very disruptive, potentially very disruptive time. And I think we can all see that. Um, you know, I guess probably like all points in human history, there are, you know, we're on a knife edge and for some people it's heaven on earth and for some people it's hell on earth all the time, every, every day. And uh, it's a good and the bad. So I do want to come back to your final chapter the bulk of your final chapter, which actually answers or it provides your answer to the question of what is a complex system. It is the payoff of having gotten through the previous chapters, uh, enumerating these features, understanding how they come together. And maybe as a, a, as a summary, could you describe the, the, ex- the two extremes, the extreme positions um, that you've come across of, of, of defining complex systems, and then this range of mediating definitions between them. I'm thinking of nihilism, pragmatism on the opposite ends, and then these realist views in between, just to get a survey of how researchers, commentators have heretofore described the, uh, described this work. No, you currently in a place. Okay, I'll, I'll start, and uh, I'm sure James um, will come in. The, there is, you see it very often, um, you know, complexity is being conflated with complicated. So, ooh, that's too complicated. And instead people say, ooh, that's too complex, which means something is complex because we don't understand it. But once we start understanding it, then it ceases to be complex. And so, so that's it, which means there is no such thing as a complex system per se. It's just a label for well, for things that seem very messy and maybe they can be understood, maybe not. Um, and I suppose that's one way to think about nihilism, at least from a physicist's point of view, that's how, <clears throat> how I understand it. But then you can, you can argue against that. Well, look, there are all these complexity scientists out there. Um, clearly they're doing something. And what they're doing is well, they're doing science, and how do they do it? They have all these tools, as we said before, computational tools <clears throat> and mathematical tools, and they are what what brings them together, or what holds them together as a as a group, is the tools that they have in common, and whether they are interested in in 
beehives or um, or brains is relevant. They have the tools in common. And so what is a complex system? Well, it's really a community of people who use the same tools. There is no system per se, but there is a group of people who use similar tools. So those presumably are the extremes. And then... Um, you know, once we, we've gone through all these examples and thought about them uh, over and over again, we think that neither of these really captures um, what we observe in, in the field and what we observe in terms of the results that people are getting out of their, out of their science. So I, I, I prefer, James, for you to, to, um, to represent the, the middle ground, so to speak. Right. I guess the most important thing we're saying is that there is this new science of complexity science and that when we look at systems in um, in in the right way we can we can see them as complex systems and that that they the in that sense complex systems are real you know these features are real they they happen um, and you get these universal forms of behavior, you get these common features across different kinds of system, and um, there's not really a lot more to it than that, I think. Well, I suppose the features are what makes it clear that, you know, our view almost must be that there is such a thing as right. a complex system because we can identify the features that make it complex. So if you find something that has, you know, self-organization, uh, whatever it might be, nonlinearity and so on, you have come across a complex system. So in what sense should that not be real if everything that we're talking about is observable and measurable? Which is why this chapter before is so important. You can measure these things. And then, you know, my conclusion is when I can measure it, I, I presume <laughs> it exists. Right. So we're not measuring a single mm. thing that is complexity, but we're measuring these features and the features together, you know, that not every complex system has all of them, but there are lots of systems that have all of them, and they come in different forms, as I said before, but you know, they really are complex systems, and there really is complexity in the sense that there really are these features, and they occur in the, because of the um, numerosity, diversity, and disorder, um, and feedback, uh, and the systems being driven or out of equilibrium. So as we begin to wind down, are there any other messages from the book that we didn't get to that you'd like to bring up? Um, well, I, mean, I was going to say that one of the things about human social structures is if there's anybody from the university listening, um, <laughs> that when you let human beings organize themselves in a, a modular way with a distributed um, power structure and you allow information to flow freely, um, then I think you get um, better decision making and um, people tend to be happier doing what they're doing. So I'm a, a great believer in that whatever um, field of life and work that we're talking about, that um, if you let the individuals doing the job collectively decide how the job should be done, it, it, you know, they, they're often it's often more efficient, um, even from the point of view of the, of the management. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we should think of, should think about our ourselves as complex systems in the light of complexity science, and we should we should put a lot of effort into that collectively. Scientists, governments, policymakers. Yeah, that is a point well taken. Let me ask I a question. Business that... people as well. I mean, I think, as I was saying, some business people know this. You know, there was a management doctrine called management by wandering around, where the management tried to sort of um, understand things from the point of view of the working environment rather than from top down. And um, the military understand it very well, right? They have a distributed power structure so they can operate as independent units, and so they've got this robustness. And they don't just have a single channel of communication from the top. And if that message is broken, everyone falls apart. They, they, they implicitly understand this fact about, about how to achieve efficient um, organization of human beings. It actually requires giving agency to, 
distributing agency throughout the network, not holding onto it all at the top. All right. So to be, to wind down now, there's one question I wanted to ask, uh, which is something that occurred to me while reading the book. We have this partition, however coarse we want to, or how fuzzy we want to allow it to be between simple systems and complex systems. There's this quote that at least some mathematicians are fond of, uh, whose attribution I could not trace. Classifying systems into linear and nonlinear is like classifying the universe into bananas and non-bananas. And so Given the varieties of complexity you've identified, I wonder where you land on this. How do we think about, or how should we think about this course classification into simple and complex? It's a fun quote. I, I totally agree. The, the two aspects here that are, are really worth commenting on. One is um, the linear versus nonlinear. Um, I'll, I'll take that later. And then, you know, after I've attempted to, to answer your question about simple versus complex. And it, it seems to me that simple is not really the counterpart of complex, um, but instead simple versus complicated. I think it makes more sense. So, um, and that leaves the question of what's the counterpart to complex, uh, apart from not complex. <laughs> but it the answer, I should think, is, is also given in the book by all these features that we've gone through and discussed in, in detail now in this past hour, which are, you know, something is complex. Um, well, if something is complex, then it is an open system, a driven system, a nonlinear system, a self-organizing system, and so on and so forth. So you would then have to say if something is not complex, well, then some of these things, or maybe all of them, are not there. So... If it is not complex, then, well, it's it's a say it's a closed system with no feedback in it. Um, so there isn't just one opposite to complex, but it is a whole a whole set and set of sets of things that are opposite to complex. Um, and since linear is part of part of that, so if something is is linear, then it's very likely not complex. Um, Linearity is super important. So to actually classify the world into linear and nonlinear is not such a it's not such a, such a stupid thing, um, yeah, because it, it makes a huge difference whether something is linear or nonlinear. Yeah. Right. Even For if example, general, general relativity is nonlinear, and quantum physics is linear, and that's an issue. And it's a, it's mind boggling. Yeah. Exactly. So finally, what's in the pipeline for the two of you, are you still collaborating, and what are you working on now? So since since I've uh, I've moved university in the meantime, I can't just pop over to James' office anymore, which is a huge disadvantage of my new post. <laughs> um, so in that sense, we don't have a project at the moment, but um, you know we'll we'll meet at the conference next year, and so who knows what what comes then. Um, so. For me, I, I'm fascinated by this. Well, I, I'd really like to learn from complexity science about some of the issues we, we touched upon. So democracy is currently something I look at um, in terms of mathematical analysis, and um, that's ongoing work, so that's all I can say. Um, I'm doing various projects in philosophy of physics and philosophy of science, and um, I, I hope that Carolina and I will work together more on this. I, I think at the moment we're waiting to see what the, the community makes of, makes of the book and um, you know I'm sure it won't, won't be the last word and um, hopefully you know, future work will, will come out of um, what other people have got to say in response to what we have to say. Um, but yeah I'm, I'm also very interested in, in thinking about AI and um, and robotics and human beings collectively as a complex system, in, or many different kinds of complex system actually, um, all you know, all put together. Um, so I, I think it's going to be more and more important that, that people do think that way. And we'll wrap it there. Um, I've been talking with James Lademan and Carolina Weisner about their book, "What Is a Complex System," published by Yale UP in 2020. Carolina, James, thank you so very much for joining me on New Books in Mathematics. Thank you very much. Been a pleasure.